My name is Lance Starr. I am the Media Relations Manager for FAIR. have been for about five years now. I want to announce very quickly that we're going to make a quick change to the program. Instead of John Tavetnis being your first speaker, we're going to hear first from Brant Gardner. And it is my privilege to introduce Brant, who has become one of my favorite speakers. He has spoken at every FAIR conference up to this point. I believe. Did you speak at the first one, Brant? Just that. Okay, so he's done every one except the first one. But I wasn't there for that one either, so I didn't miss anything. Brant Gardner is the product manager for a privately held software company. His academic background includes work towards a PhD in Mesoamerican ethno-history the, at the State University of New York, Albany. His published works on Mesoamerica include an analysis of classical Nahuatl kinship terminology, an ethno-historic investigation into the identification of the use of Kosho to designate a people and language in southern Mexico, and an examination of the Aztec legends of the sun. In the near future, Coford Books is publishing a series of books by Brandt entitled Second Witness, Analytical and Contextual Commentary on the Book of Mormon, Volume 1. Covering 1st Nephi, it should be available sometime before the end of this year. His commentary examines the Book of Mormon text from different perspectives to highlight the multiple dimensions of, his, of this most marvelous book. I give you Brandt Gardner. While we're getting all our pieces of equipment put together here, I have to make just a small correction. They didn't change the introduction since last year, and we were really hoping to get this thing out last year. Now 2006 is the earliest. The good news, if there is any, is we're hoping to bring the whole thing out at once. But cross my fingers, I haven't seen any of it yet. As an article of faith, the Latter-day Saints affirm that we believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. The book itself also declares that it is an abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi and also the Lamanites. While it is possible for the Word of God to not be a history, most Latter-day Saints understand that it is not possible for this book to be the Word of God if it is not the history it proclaims to be. As Kent P. Jackson declared, the historicity of the Book of Mormon is fundamental to what it is and what it intends to accomplish. The acceptance or rejection of the Book of Mormon as scripture often hinges on the acceptance or rejection of the Book of Mormon as history. Lumidgely described the basic lines of the historical debate. There is nothing in the Book of Mormon that suggests that it should be read as anything other than historical fact. On the other hand, critics of the Book of Mormon have always insisted that it's a product of the 19th century, that it reflects the thinking and the world of Joseph Smith, or one of his contemporaries, immediately prior to its publication. In keeping with a dichotomous appraisal of the prophet Joseph Smith by believer and critic, both believers and critics tend to approach the question of the historicity of the Book of Mormon as an either-or proposition. For the critics, this is essential. For any indication of authentic antiquity would appear to validate the historicity and therefore Joseph Smith's claim that it represents the translation of an ancient document. For the believer, however, the faithful declaration of antiquity has led to such a focus on the ancient world that the rather obvious aspects of modern production receive little attention. Believers seldom recognize that it really is undeniable that the conditions of the American Northeast left their imprint on the text of the Book of Mormon. For instance, it was published in English, not French. Had Joseph Smith lived not too much farther northeast, a Jew would never have been controversial. A slightly different set of political pressures in England in the 1600s would have kept the Geneva Bible as the, net, uh, the standard for the English language, and the Book of Mormon would never have so clearly imitated the style of the King James Version of the Bible. The problem for the historian is that the Book of Mormon declares a dual production. The plate text is declared to be ancient. 
The translation, however, is inextricably associated with Joseph Smith. This dual production complicates the issue, but not beyond similar efforts to understand the historicity of the Bible. The Bible, in English, is also a translation. It also faces a difference between a known history and a textually asserted history. It proposes simple, similar issues about whether the textually asserted history might reflect actual events or only literature or myth. Historian Baruch Halpern provides an interesting analogy that he created to describe approaches to the Bible, and it's appropriate to our discussion of the historicity of the Book of Mormon. The image of the map clarifies the various approaches to the Book of Mormon. The map, say, of Europe includes cities and highways of the 10th century, of the 11th century, and so on, continuing into our own time. In effect, the confessionalist maintains that all those cities were on the map from the start. That God created Europe and the map in the 10th century. Critical study divulges that this is not so, that some of the cities and highways appeared later, and it is the job of the historian to determine when each town, highway, and so on was added. Negative fundamentalists, however, date the whole map by its latest elements. Because the map reflects a view from the 20th century, they argue that it cannot be used to get at earlier times. Just as does the Book of Mormon, or the Bible, the Book of Mormon has its confessionalists who accept the text uncritically. It is also susceptible to what Halpern calls negative fundamentalists, precisely because it has a history that is demonstrably related to the 19th century American Northeast. The historian's task for the Book of Mormon is one of analyzing the various roads in its map and discerning the time period in which they were created. Our task would be infinitely easier if we had, and could read, the original plates of Mormon. Lacking those plates makes our task more difficult, but not impossible. There are ways that we can use the modern text to examine its possible relationship to a different and ancient culture. In archaeology, contextual clues can help to date the various roads of the European map and determine when they were laid down. Textual archaeology similarly requires contextual clues to determine the time and culture that created the text. We are looking for what may be termed the production culture that created the text or the production culture of each road that is in the text, the conditions and the assumptions that were prevalent when that text was produced. It's virtually impossible for a text to be created without some trace of its production culture. Orson Scott Card described the problem this way. Joseph Smith's work should proclaim itself to be a phony on every page today. This is because every storyteller, no matter how careful he is, will inadvertently confess his own character and the society he lives in. He can make every conscious effort. He can be the best educated scholar you could possibly find. But if he tries to write something that is not in his own culture, he will give himself away with every unconscious choice he makes. Yet he'll never know he's doing it because it won't occur to him that it could be any other way. A similar explanation from a social historian's perspective comes from Bruce J. Malina, professor of theology at Creighton University, and Richard L. Rohrbaugh, professor of religious studies at Lewis and Clark College. Readers and writers always participate in a social system that provides the clues for filling in between the lines in infancy. Uh, filling in between the lines, meanings are embedded in a social system that is shared and understood by all participants in any communication process. When both the reader and the writer share the same social system, meaning may be communicated with reasonable clarity because the shared social system provides a common ground for understanding. When the writer leaves spaces between the lines, the shared social system fills them in. The problem with historical texts is that a text that was written anciently was not written only in a different time, but for a different time. The production culture is different from the reading culture. Malina and Rohrbach explain the resulting problem. Although meanings not rooted in a shared social system can sometimes be communicated, 
such communication inevitably requires extended explanation because a writer cannot depend on the reader to conjure up the proper sets of related images or concepts needed to complete the text. In Orson Scott Card's world, there's a great deal of extended explanation. This is not simply the nature of the literary effort, it's the nature of the attempt to explain the unusual, that which is not shared with the contemporary reader. Science fiction as a genre frequently demands both the creation of the unusual and extended descriptions that make the unusual understandable. One of the differences between the Book of Mormon and imaginative literature is precisely in this missing level of detail. It claims to be a representative of the unusual, but it rarely explains why or how it is unusual. The historical question is whether this lack of explanation is because there are no unusual features or because the text was written in a time and place when they were not unusual and therefore did not need explanation. As we begin to dig into the Book of Mormon's historical layer, there's an important distinction that should be made in the type of data that we analyze. Malina and Rohrbaugh reminded us that there are two participants in the text, both the writer and the reader. There is great danger that a reader's culture will influence the perception of the writer's culture. They explain, we have suggested that each time a text is read by a new reader, the fields of reference tend to shift and multiply because of the reader's cultural location. Among some literary theorists, this latter phenomenon is called recontextualization. This term refers to multiple ways different readers may complete a text as a result of reading it over against their different social contexts. They describe this process using the Lucan story of the inn at Bethlehem. Consciously or unconsciously, we've often used mental images or scenarios drawn from modern American experience to fill in unwritten pictures that complete the text. Thus, when Luke tells us that the family of Jesus could find no room at the inn in Bethlehem, it is not difficult for most Americans to construct the scene. We do it from our modern experience of overbooked hotels or motels in crowded locations. That such a scenario is completely inappropriate, however, never dawns on most American readers. They simply do not know that ancient Bethlehem had no hotels, that advanced reservations were an unknown phenomenon and more important, that room in any village lodging was based on kinship or social rank rather than offered on a first-come, first first-served basis. The result is that meanings realized in reading text inevitably derive from a social system. Reading is always a social act. If both the reader and the writer share the same social system and the same experience, adequate communication is highly probable. But if either reader or writer comes from a different social system, then, as a rule, non-understanding, or at best misunderstanding, will be the result. The problem of misunderstanding based on the reader's culture is immediately applicable to the question of the historicity of the Book of Mormon. The text does not explicitly declare its geographic location, and so the reader must supply some external understanding in order to locate the action in time and place. With no other available context, the original response to the Book of Mormon was built from a reader's environment. Books such as Ethan Smith, Few of the Hebrews, and Josiah Priest's American Antiquities were influential in their own right, but probably represented a codification and expansion of popular opinion that formed part of the information environment of the early saints. Not surprisingly, those saints read the Book of Mormon against that background. It has proven overwhelmingly tempting for some to assume that this reader's context necessarily informed the writer's production culture. We must be careful to examine the writer's production culture, not the reader's. Fortunately, scholarship both in and outside the church has developed to the point where we no longer need supply a nebulous 19th century understanding to our reading of the Book of Mormon. The current best Latter-day Saint scholarship suggests that the Book of Mormon took place in a limited area of the region known as Mesoamerica. The explosion of secular scholarship concerning Mesoamerican cultures in the last 50 years has created a newly available historical picture. The Book of Mormon may now be compared to two different and reasonably well-known production cultures, 
the American Northeast of the 19th century, and Mesoamerica from the times claimed by the Book of Mormon. Apart from the obvious 19th century elements of language and imitative style, other features strongly suggest the 19th century Northeast was their production culture. Mark Thomas discusses the similarity of certain phrases in the Book of Mormon to the evangelical vocabulary recorded in documents contemporary to Joseph Smith. In addition to the biblical phrases, evangelicals had their own conventional phrases or formulas for describing conversion, redeeming love, to taste redeeming love, to hear the shouts of redeeming love, and to sing the song of redeeming love, a phrase that also appears in the Book of Mormon, Alma 5 and 26. Both the specificity of the phrase and the theological context in which it appears locate this phrase in Joseph Smith's cultural background. Although not proof, it is strong evidence suggesting that the phrase to sing the song of redeeming love as found in Alma 5 and 26 comes from a 19th century production culture. If our English text were claimed to be an original, uh, original ancient document, the presence of this phrase and others like it, which may be localized in both time and space to Joseph Smith's era, would be strong evidence that the production culture of the entire work was modern, not ancient. Similarly, phrases that obviously copyright with the King James Version of the New Testament would be strong indications of anachronism if the English text were considered to be the original text. Such anachronisms of vocabulary, however, may be indictments of the translation and not necessarily of the underlying text. For instance, King James Bible speaks of candles. In the ancient Mediterranean, candles would be an anachronism as oil lamps, were, you know, oil lamps provided most light. Although technically incorrect, the anachronistic term candle may be confidently ascribed to the translator, not the original text. The textual road itself was laid down much earlier. It is the translation road that was laid down at a later time and reflects concepts appropriate to the time of the translation rather than the time of the original. Of course, the Book of Mormon presents a problem because we do not have the original text in the original language. We do not have the ability to consult the original language to confidently separate vocabulary issues into text or translation. Nevertheless, because it claims to be a translation, we must treat the English text as a translation, not the original. When we find phrases or vocabulary that reflect a 19th century production culture, we cannot tell immediately whether they are artifacts of the underlying text or of the translation. William Clements, a professor in the Department of English, Philosophy and Languages at Arkansas State University, points out this very problem in a 19th century translation of a Native American document. Rufus Sage translated a brulee narrative into English in 1846. Similar to the Book of Mormon, the original is no longer available. Similar to the Book of Mormon, aspects of the translation indicate the time period in which the translation was made. Several of the elements of the text probably derive more from Sage than the original narrator. For instance, the scenic description, the silvery springs overhung by drags and shaded by cottonwoods, must reflect the romantic literary aesthetic of Sage's time. The careful pacing of the narrative with each phase of, the phase of its progress fully explained and related to earlier phases suggests the hand of the text maker, as does the attention to detail in the dialogue, especially the story within the story. Throughout the text, the language strikes 20th century ears as too formal for a story of this sort, a personal anecdote devoid of apparent ritual associations. One must wonder to what extent English words Sage has employed in his text represent what the narrator actually said. For example, Sage uses the English term conflict, then fray, then fight. Are these translations of the same Lakota word? If Sage's three words in fact reflect real variation in the narrator's diction, do they catch the different shadings of the original Lakota vocabulary? The mixture of somewhat formal literary English usages, for instance a face suffused in blood, with stereotypical Indianisms, three moons sped, also raises the question about the tonal level of the text. Yet Sage did not see himself as being unfaithful to his originals. 
Regarding another text he made from a Brule story, he wrote, in penning the above, I was guided solely by the leading incidents as related in my hearing. In truth, though, he was also guided by his sense of the literary, of what was necessary to make a good tale in a written European language. Sage's attempt at a faithful translation of a Native American document shows evidence of its production culture, just as we would expect. There are phrases and themes that almost certainly derive from the translator's culture rather than the culture of the original narrator. Quite apart from the text being translated, the English version places the translation's production culture firmly in the 1800s. This is precisely the problem we have with the Book of Mormon. We have evidence of the modern production culture precisely at the level of vocabulary. We see the parallels of phrases that are similar to documents, and when we see parallels of phrases that are similar to other documents, we may suspect that the translation layer is contaminated with the culture that produced those phrases. What we cannot say for certain, however, is whether or not the, that these contaminations that make the Book of Mormon read as a good tale written in a European language have any relationship to the underlying text. In order to more accurately assess the production culture of the Book of Mormon, we must move beyond items that are based on vocabulary. One place where the subconscious production culture should be most evident is in the event structures, those places where we see a concept being employed in the text rather than being explained in the text. A feature that is often argued to point toward a modern production culture for the Book of Mormon is the text's description of political sentiment. Richard L. Bushman describes one such claim. The late Thomas O'Day, a sympathetic but critical scholar, thought that American sentiments, I should put this up here, um, thought that American sentiments permeate the work. In it are found the democratic, the republican, the anti-monarchial, and the egalitarian doctrines that pervaded the climate of opinion in which it was conceived, and that enter into the expressions and concerns of its Nephite kings, prophets, and priests, as naturally as they later come from the mouths of Mormon leaders preaching to the people in Utah. Evidence for O'Day's position would come from seeing the tax insistence on the voice of the people as evidence of a democratic urge, and Mosiah's condemnation of monarchies as reflective of Republican sentiment. Those features certainly reflect a modern vocabulary. The question is whether or not they behave in modern ways when we see those principles operating in the text. Bushman elsewhere described his attempt to discover the Democratic and Republican features of the Book of Mormon. When I was asked to give some talks in Utah during the bicentennial of the American Revolution, I decided to examine the political principles embodied in the Book of Mormon and make some application to our revolution and constitution. I thought this would be simple enough because of the switch from monarchy to a republic during the reign of Mosiah. I was sure that somewhere in Mosiah's statement I would find ideas relevant to the modern world. With that in mind, I accepted the invitation to talk, but not until a few months before I was able to appear, or I was to appear, did I get down to work. To my dismay, I could not find what I was looking for. Everything seemed just off the point, confused and baffling. I could not find the directions for a sound republic that I had expected. Along with O'Day, Bushman apparently believed that the democratic vocabulary of the translation layer would be reproduced in the event structures of the text. He continues describing the result of his confrontation with the evidence of actions rather than vocabulary. I long ago learned that it is better to flow with the evidence than compel compliance with one's preformed ideas, so I asked instead, what does the Book of Mormon say about politics? To my surprise, I discovered it was a quite unrepublican book. Not only was Nephi a king, and the monarchy represented as the ideal government in an ideal world, but the supposedly Republican government instituted under Mosiah did not function that way at all. There was no elected legislature, and the chief judges usually inherited their office rather than being chosen for it. At this point in our analysis, we have a connection to the 19th century politics that can be seen on the translation layer, but which cannot be confirmed on the layer of the event structures. The lack of textual confirmation of the vocabulary cautions us against positing a 19th century production culture, but it does not necessarily exclude it. 
Perhaps the difference is related to Joseph's imagination, although it seems unlikely they would use obvious terms for inobvious structures and then leave them unexplained. Until relatively recently, this was the end of the question. Doubt could be cast on a 19th century production culture, but lacking a non-19th century culture against which comparisons could be made, there was no clear way to develop a more compelling argument. In terms of Malign and Rohrbaugh used, we had only the modern recontextualization and not necessarily the original context. The recognition of Mesoamerica as a plausible location for the Book of Mormon, however, gives us the opportunity to compare the text's political structures against a different culture. While it's long been understood that the king's uh, let's see, the ability to read Maya text yields a reasonable picture of Maya politics. While it's long been understood that, the king, that kings reigned over Maya cities, it is now apparent that those kings did not rule autocratically. They ruled with the assistance of a council formed from the leaders of important lineages. Political power was held by balancing the tensions among those lineages. This is most dramatically attested in the reign of Yashpasach near the final years of Copan, when he acts on monumental sculpture in the company with important nobles, rather than majestically alone, as most kings did. These lineages or councils operated in buildings designated as popolna, or mat houses. The mat was a symbol of ruling power, and these buildings are therefore locations associated with the political system. They might be attached to the state, but they were all pre also present in smaller communities. The various popol na functioned for the debate of policy, as well as centers for the instruction and ritual dance. The great houses or lineages formed a governmental layer that functioned just below the monarchy, and which was integral to the political process. Even under the monarchy, there were political structures similar to the Nephite judges. In fact, John Paul notes that in one of the later Mishtek codices, the four priests specifically conformed to the descriptions in the Relación de Tilantongo and elsewhere of a body of judges who administered the realm for the king. In the course of history, some Mesoamerican communities appeared to have followed the same political path as did the Nephites. They disposed of the position of the king. When they did so, these previous structures remained in place, but were elevated to perform the centralized ruling function. There is some evidence that this took place at Teotihuacan. It is much more certain that a council of lineage heads ruled in Chichen Itza. While all of these examples post-date the Book of Mormon, there's no reason to believe that the essential political structures were significantly different in earlier times. The Book of Mormon describes the voice of the people as a function of monarchy as well as the judges. When Mosiah declares his sons eligible, uh, declares eligible sons to become king, he seeks the voice of the people concerning which son might become king in Mosiah 29, 1 through 2. When Nimhi becomes king, he does so according to the voice of the people, Mosiah 7 and 9. The Book of Mormon represents this political feature as a continuation from the days of the monarchy, but applied to new conditions. That continuity is evidenced in Mesoamerican examples where the monarch has been eliminated. Descriptions of the way the voice of the people functioned are rare, but fit better with discussions in the Popol Na than as a democratic vote. See Alma 2, 3 through 7. When the Book of Mormon describes a reign of judges that retains features of the monarchy, it is completely at home in a, Mes in this, uh, in a Mesoamerican setting. The shift from king to judges is not only understandable in Mesoamerican politics, Mesoamerican political structures show us how the Nephite system plausibly moved from a monarchy to judgeship. The change declared by Mosiah was not a wholesale alteration of a political system, but rather a modification of a system that elevated existing structures to new functions. What do the Book of Mormon political structures tell us about the production culture of the Book of Mormon? They tell us that the strongest evidence for the 19th century production environment is limited to the translation layer. It is vocabulary based. When we attempt to see that vocabulary enacted in the text, it behaves differently from modern expectations, but in ways consonant with the plausible historical production culture. As Orson Scott's card suggested, it is in the unconscious and in obvious aspects that the text ought to show its true production culture. That is precisely the level at which the antiquity of the text's political descriptions are most strongly attested. Of course, an examination of political structures is only one element. The ultimate case for the historicity of the Book of Mormon will depend upon multiple similar examples. However, we have not yet finished with our discussion 
of the ways in which political structures can teach us something about the historicity of the Book of Mormon. Malina and Rohrbach pointed out that modern readers frequently recontextualize an ancient document because their social reference differ from those of the texts. When the correct context is restored for the modern reader, the text takes on new vistas of meaning. For example, the Book of Judges contains the story of the murder of the Moabite king Eglon by Ehud. The story begins, when the children, but when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised, up, uh, raised them up a deliverer, Ehud the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed. Judges 3 and 15. The text tosses in the description that of Ehud as a man left-handed without any explanation as to why we might care that he was left-handed. As Baruch Halpern explains, Ehud is not left-handed, rather, his right hand was itter. This adjective comes from a root meaning to bind and suggests that the use of the hand was somehow impeded. In all three texts, using his right hand was itter, the left-handers are Benjamites. In no other text is handed this figure. The logical inference is that Benjamin was known for producing southpaws. This could have been done so as, until recently the Maori did, by binding the right arms of young children, hence bound as to his right hand, and inculcating dexterity with the left. On this supposition, Ehud was not, as the translations have it, a man left-handed. He was one of a breed of men schooled in the use of the left hand for war. In this example, cultural data is packed into a term that is left unexplained. Read from a modern, ex uh, modern perspective, being left-handed is a bit of non-essential data. In the cultural context that produced the description, however, it's very important clue to Ehud's deadly nature. Such information is not simply nice to know. It is essential to the correct understanding of the motivations and the events in the text. Given a text without context, as the Book of Mormon has been, events float unrelated and unexplained on an unknown ocean. If, however, we find the correct production culture, we should be able to apply the missing context and retrieve sense from near nonsense. If we find the correct environment, it should improve our comprehension of the text. As a final test of the production environment for the Book of Mormon politics, I will examine one of the popular stories of the Book of Mormon. The account of Ammon at the waters of Sebus is both well known and entirely misunderstood. If we strip the story of its faith-inspiring aspects, it becomes nearly nonsensical. Allow me to retell the story in a way that highlights its anomalous aspects. Ammon, a traditional enemy, volunteers to be a servant for the Lamanite king. Instead of killing or jailing his enemy, the king immediately offers one of his daughters in marriage. The Lamanite king has an ongoing problem with his fields with his flocks at the waters of Sebus. Several times a band of men have scattered the flocks. In spite of the respeeded scatterings, it never occurs to the king to send armed guards to protect them. He could have done so because in the aftermath of these events, he suggests that his armies could protect Ammon. Strangely enough, however, they couldn't protect the flocks. Mormon indicates that it's thieves who are after the flocks, but they pick a particularly difficult target. The text specifically mentions that the flocks are scattered insomuch that they fled in many ways. And by the way, we all know that these were sheep because Arnold Freeberg painted sheep, except it is absolutely impossible that they were sheep because sheep do not scatter. It is essential to the story that they scatter. They cannot be sheep, although we all know they were. <laughs> Because Freeberg said so. Ammon suggests that he and his servants round up the flocks. It does not appear that this has ever occurred to anybody before. That they were successful concern, confirms that the so-called thieves did not get anything for their effort. We must assume that other servants could have gathered the flocks. However, they preferred to lose their lives rather than track down the errant animals. Apparently, only after the flocks are scattered do the servants give Ammon the bad news. Now the king will slay us as he has our brethren, because their flocks were scattered by the wickedness of those men. First the king offers him a daughter, then he sends Ammon into a situation where it's virtually certain he'll be executed. As one of my friends said, that daughter had to be ugly. <laughs> Ammon seems to be the only one to whom it occurred to fight back. 
Just as the king never supplied armed guards, there is no record of any other servant resisting. None of Ammon's companion servants joined in the fight. In the spiritual aftermath, the king and the queen are lying as though dead. When the servant Abish gathers people to see the miracle, several of those who come are relatives of those who scattered the flocks, including the brother of a man who was slain. The text does not tell us why the king lives among thieves. If they're going to go get someone, it's going to be somebody who's pretty close by. These are people who have to live very close to where the king lives. Of course, the spiritual message is the same in spite of all of these oddities. However, in historical document, we expect that the actions of the participants of the events would make some kind of sense. This is where the lack of cultural context for this tale becomes dramatically obvious. Everything that we ought to know to fill in these blanks of nonsense is missing. The motivations and the reasons are not clearly explained as they would be in a science fiction story that attempted to create an unusual situation. This story is either the result of a very poor writer or of an unexplained cultural context. Mesoamerican political tensions supply the missing context. Maya kings balance their own power against competing lineages. The translated texts tell us some instances that appear to indicate a, uh, a change in the power balance with a new lineage assuming the throne and creating a new dynasty. Historian David Drew describes the problem for Maya kings. Increasingly recognized today is the likelihood of a constant dynamic tension between the ruler, along with the family group, the royal lineage that surrounded him, and other powerful and long-established lineages within a city-state. The centralizing success of royal dynasties almost certainly obscures the extent to which kings depended upon and negotiated with other political factions. For each dynasty of the classic period had in earlier centuries merely been one, of, uh, many, um, one among many of such patrilineages or king groups. It is impossible to know with any precision how ruling lines established themselves at the end of the pre-classic period, as war leaders perhaps, or as mediators in local disputes. However they came by their authority, they could only have maintained it through consent and cooperation, despite the impression of absolute power that their monuments create. From the 8th century at Copan in particular, there is some evidence of that, of that negotiation that must have gone on behind the scenes. There is little reason to believe that this kind of jostling was not seen in earlier centuries, too. All aspects of the story of Amnon at the waters of Cebus make perfect sense against the backdrop of a Mesoamerican king with a com competition from a powerful rival lineage. Note that when the king is discussing the incident with Ammon, he asks, Tell me by what power ye slew and smote off the arms of my brethren that scattered my flocks. While it's possible that the phrase my brethren is extremely generic, it would be unusual to presume robbers as brothers of a king and equally as unusual to include anyone outside of the city as one's brothers. These thieves really are brethren and that's the whole reason for the trouble. Now, let me retell the story against the backdrop of the Mesoamerican political situation and the problems with Lamoni's brethren. Ammon comes before the king and asks to be a servant. Ammon is a Nephite and therefore not only an outsider but an enemy. The king offers to make him family by marrying one of his daughters. If Ammon had accepted, he would also have accepted rule by the new family and therefore be under the king's control. By refusing, Ammon continues to be an outsider and therefore potentially uncontrollable. The king decides to place Ammon in a position where this condition of being outside the city's political intrigues might be advantageous. He sends him to the waters of Cebus. The dumb thieves who don't get much for their raids are actually getting everything they want. Key to understanding the story is that whatever ruse was employed to allow the fiction that they were robbers, the reality was that they were well known to the servants of the king. They were members of a rival lineage who were attempting to alter the balance of power. By scattering the king's flocks, they were embarrassing the king and therefore diminishing his appearance of total control. Because the rival lineage was sufficiently powerful, the king could not move against them directly without creating civil war. Therefore, the king could not send armed guards. If he killed members of the competing lineage, it would break whatever illusion of cooperation there was and instigate civil disorder. The guards cannot defend themselves for the same reason that the king cannot send troops. The king could not, however, allow the situation to completely embarrass him. Therefore, the fiction of thievery is either created or allowed to remain. 
because something had to be done to restore the king's honor in the situation, the guards are punished for their failure. And the king places the failure of the guards, on, a failure on the guards and executes them to demonstrate that he's still controlling the situation. Along comes Ammon, who is an outsider to the political intrigue. Ammon is not a member of either lineage, and as an outsider would be unaware of the identities of these brethren thieves or the delicate political situation. He is a wild card in a high-stakes game. The king deliberately puts him into a situation where it is possible, even probable, that he will use his sword, where all other servants have held theirs. It's quite possible that the king expect Ammon to do some damage, but ultimately fail to protect the flocks. From the king's perspective, any damage that Ammon did would improve the king's standing in the political impasse by gaining more revenge without political cost, because it was done by an outsider. When Abish finds many relatives of the robbers as well as the brothers of the slain thief close by, we have our confirmation that this is a delicate political dance. Only if the family is part of the royal court would so many relatives of outlaws be that close to the home compound of a king. That the family of a thief is that close to the king tells us that the thieves were also that close. The thieves at the water of Sebus were not from another city. They were not miscreants ostracized from this city. They were of a family that was sufficiently prestigious that it spent time in close proximity to the king. It had to be a competing royal lineage. This reinterpretation of the events against a Mesoamerican cultural background creates sense from the near nonsense of the contextless account. Our analysis of the Book of Mormon politics tells us not only that the, the structural elements trace more firmly to a Mesoamerican context, but that the Mesoamerican context provides needed information that fills in the gaps between the assumed understanding of the writer and ours as the reader. Because the Book of Mormon specifically claims to be a translation, we are obliged to examine it as a translated text. The examination of political data from the Book of Mormon highlights both the necessity and the function functionality of making such an analytical separation in the way we understand our evidentiary task. There are political terms that have an obvious similarity to the 19th century production culture. However, since those similarities only exist on the level of vocabulary and cannot be seen in the way the political concepts are worked out in the text, we may confidently ascribe the 19th century similarities to the translation layer. It is really very easy to demonstrate that the translation error was, layer was a result of the 19th century production culture. Of course, that's never really been in question. When we dive below the surface of the vocabulary of the translation and attempt to deal with the event structures of the text, the situation is dramatically different. Where the translation layer fits comfortably into the 19th century, the event structures are discordant with it. In the case of political structures, we find that they do not match with the expectations of the vocabulary. They do, however, fit into the context of the time and place that best fits the geographic features described in the text. This last type of evidence is particularly important because it comes directly from the unconscious and unwritten portions of the text. The Book of Mormon makes complete sense as a historical document, but does so only when we place it in the correct historical context. Without the correct production talk culture, the text is anomalous and sometimes foreign to human experience, as in the contextless reading of Ammon at the waters of Sebus placed in the correct production culture where the unstated assumptions of the writer become explicit for the reader, the text authentically describes the human motivations appropriate to that historical time and place. Thank you. That's okay. You're in good shape. That's you're good. Right. Get you're back where you're going. I won't touch you. Yeah, you stay here, though. You stay here. I'll stay here. At this point, if you have questions for Brant, please quickly write them on a card. And we have Lance who's standing for the First one, what's your theory of translation, word for word or thought for thought? And who makes the word choices? <laughs> I suspect that that is about a 30 or 40 page written answer. If, if I were really to give it. So I'll try to, uh, to make it as simple as I can. 
one of the problems that we have in looking at the translation is very often we assume that we understand what the translation is because we believe that it was tri translated uh, by inspiration. And since we believe it was translated by inspiration, we know that means that it's true and uh, you know, everything there must be fine. When, when you start looking at the evidence for how the translation was made, however, it's very clear that whatever happens inside of Joseph Smith's brain as he understands what it is he's supposed to write, it comes out in language that's appropriate to his time and place. There is some part of Joseph Smith that is part of the filter that happens between the comprehension of the meaning that's on the place and what shows up in the English. So, do I believe it's a word for word transla translation? I don't think the evidence supports that. Uh, concept for concept, uh, certainly it looks much better that way. When you start looking at what's in the Book of Mormon and the kinds of things that it talks about, some of the types of things that it's concerned with, um, it really looks like it's coming from a different location. Matt and Roper and I were talking last night, and we were talking, I was mentioning one of them that's kind of interesting. Uh, at one point in time, Alma is giving the, uh, the spirit uh, to some of his, his brethren before they go to the Zoramites, and he claps his hands on them. This seems a very odd thing to say in English, except in the ancient culture, there's two reasons why you might clap his hands. One of them is in order to make a sound, you have to go pretty quickly. Uh, the words for uh, the Holy Spirit have usually had something to do with air. Uh, in Greek and in Hebrew, they have to do with wind. And the reason is the ancients needed to have some way to explain something that was real, even though you couldn't see it or couldn't feel it, and wind was that thing. So the Spirit is associated with breath, with air. Uh, if you breathe out, you can feel yourself breathing out, and so therefore, again, that's very likely the Spirit. If you're moving your hand quickly enough to clap, you're going to create wind and therefore you will know that the spirit is coming to you because you can feel it. The other thing is that if you make the noise like a clap, now you're making claps like sounds of thunder uh, and all of these things resonate in the Mesoamerican mind. So although I don't think it's word by word, I think you're going to get a lot of things that are relatively close but hiding in places where Joseph didn't know something else that would have overridden that information. Uh, which is how I think you get New Testament quotations uh, in the Book of Mormon. Did Joseph Smith see his language or the Lord's or the Mormon's? Um, we have an indication that Joseph Smith had a vision of what was going on in the Book of Mormon. What he sees is a vision of people, however, and there's no way that a vision of people is ever going to give you an idea of place. It may not have given him much of an indication of time, only that he could see something about people and cities so that he had some idea of what he was talking about uh, and that he would talk about walled cities. Um, however, that doesn't mean that he had a real firm understanding of what was going on. And in many cases, it really does appear that Joseph Smith uh, would probably be surprised at some of the things that the Book of Mormon said, uh, which if he were an author should not have happened. Uh, how do you feel about Hugh Nibley's interpretation of Ammon at the Waters of Sebus, uh, that it was a game carried off uh, from the old world to the new? Uh, Nibley has old world glasses on and he sees everything in the context of the old world. Uh, I think he's correct that, you know, that something else is going on uh, but the Mesoamerican culture, at least for the way I see it, provides a better context for understanding what's happening, particularly since there are other events and other things that are happening where, again, this Mesoamerican culture gives us more information than anything from the old world does. Let's see. Sounds like any paradigm would have worked, uh, Republican, democracy, etc., as long as the society had a preponderance of righteous behavior. Um, does the Book of Mormon suggest an ideal or pure governing paradigm? Uh, no, oddly enough, um, other than the government of God, uh, Nephite government is not separate from Nephite religion. They do not make any separations. In the ancient world, there is no difference between politics and religion. And so religion and politics are all the same thing. The one thing that you can trace in uh, the Nephite religious version of politics is that they believe that society should be egalitarian. That is a very firm belief, and any time the Nephites start straying from this principle of egalitarian living and start to create hierarchies, you get the, uh, the complaints from the prophets and you get social tension. Unfortunately for the Book of Mormon, that happened all the time. 
but they don't, uh, you know, other than the obvious, you know, the way we do it is the way it ought to be done, they don't necessarily suggest anything for the rest of us. Uh, what was the last reference on Maya culture in regards to Ammon and the king? You'll have to catch me on that one, and uh, I'm not sure which one you meant by that one. There's a meet the speakers section at the end of the day where, yeah, you, brand, can, where you can just sit and talk to them one on one. Yeah, if, if you're not sure, I'll pull out the paper and we'll find it. It's been said that Joseph Smith did not know Reformed Egyptian, translated the place by the gift and power of God, and that God gave him uh, the word for word translation. In light of this, what's the, uh, at what point did Joseph Smith function as a genuine translator and would then be able to uh, see, impart his own culture and context? Um, the quotations that seem to indicate that he translated it word for word are not coming from Joseph, they're coming from other people. Um, and that's probably another one that would take us a long time. It appears that very early in the church, a cult of Joseph kind of developed where people made him a little bit more than he claimed to be. There were times when he had to remind people that he was a man as well as the prophet.